Okay, so it's been a great long day. You've seen great science, and now I know what you're thinking. I need a really rousing ethics talk right now. <laughs> of course, you've never heard an ethics talk. But as you're thinking about an ethics talk, it brings to mind the most boring human document ever written, which is the dreaded HR manual. Thou shall do this, thou shall not do that. And you've heard that a thousand times. And what I want to do instead of having a talk about that is I want to have a talk about adult themes. What happens when the rules change even if you're doing the right stuff? And let's start with the premise that some of this stuff is going to bug you and trigger you, and I'm sorry. In that process, let's start with an advertisement, two advertisements. And let's start with the premise that if you are marketing, what you really want to do is you want to sell stuff and not really anger people. So why did people used to publish advertisements like this? That unacceptable advertisement, right? But our rules have changed as to what's acceptable and what's not. And as you think about this stuff, one of the biggest single drivers of changing our notion of what's right and wrong has been technology. And the second thing is technology is becoming exponential. And that means that ethics may begin to change at exponential rates. And so what's the problem in a period where everybody thinks they're right and wrong? Well, the problem is that you have one wrong tweet, you wore one wrong costume a decade ago or a month ago, and you destroy a 30-year career because everybody's so damn right that they're willing to cancel you, but if the rules change, they might get canceled as well. So as you're thinking about this, if you don't believe me, let's talk about a topic which is sort of interesting, which is sex. Let's imagine that you want to talk to your grandpa and grandma about sex. So you're going to have a conversation about the birds and the bees. <laughs> and what you're going to do is you're going to bring them back, not as these wonderful white-haired, gentle people. You're going to take a time machine. You're going to bring them back as hot 20-year-olds. <laughs> so you're sitting here in the cafeteria. You're having a chat about sex with grandpa and grandma. They knew a lot about sex. They were probably married in their 20s. What would seem a little strange to them? Well, the first thing would be, grandpa, grandma, we can now have all the sex we want and never have a child. Did they have birth control? Yes, it was only sold to those who were married. And it was frowned upon. Was it effective? No, it wasn't always effective. And now all of a sudden you've decoupled the act from the consequence. That would seem very strange. Then they'd scratch their heads and then they'd say, what's this IVF stuff you speak of? Well, grandpa, grandma, it turns out that we can take a sperm, we can take an egg, we can mix it together and conceive a child without two bodies ever physically coming in contact together. In fact, they don't have to be in the same room. They don't have to be in the same country. And you can conceive a child. And they'd say, well, you know what? We'd heard about that, and we used to call that the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> and we thought that was kind of a miracle, but that would, that would be a little odd to them. And then you've got this small matter of freezing eggs, freezing sperm, having a surrogate mother. And the consequence of that is you can have identical twins born 30 years apart. So all of a sudden, you've decoupled the act from the consequence, the act from physical contact, and the act from time. And that seems normal and natural to a lot of us, but it would have seemed absolutely weird, strange, and completely wrong to your grandparents. Now let's play the same experiment going forward. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put you in a time machine. Your grandchildren are now 70 years old. You come in at 20. Do you think sex and reproduction will look the same? And do you think your current notions of what is right and what is wrong are going to be the same in some time? As you begin to be able to bring animals to term without ever having to be in a body, you may change who and how babies are carried to term. And the incentive to intervene if you don't have to go through another body also increases. Which brings us to that small matter of editing babies, which has been a scandal. And it should be a scandal. This was done without the right review. It was done before the stuff was safe. It was done without any kind of adult supervision. But what happens to your grandkids? Can you conceive of a discussion with your grandkids in 50 years where they look at you and say, Grandpa, you suspicious old horror. How in the world did you decide not to edit out my P53 gene, my KRAS gene, my BRCA gene? I've now got cancer because you were so superstitious, you didn't bother to edit my genome. Right? 
180 degree flip. And if you don't think technology changes over time, then you don't believe that people used to perform human sacrifices to bring the rain or to bring up the sun. And you don't believe that the state used to think it was perfectly fine to burn people at the stake. Maybe not even that far from here. And of course, in the fanciest parts of Paris, they used to administer justice like this. And we look at these things and we say, how dare you have done that? But this was state sanctioned, this was religion sanctioned, this was sanctioned by those who wrote the rules, and most people thought this was right. And of course, now we look at it and say, you savages. Take one of the more controversial topics of the day, slavery. How in the hell did we allow slavery for hundreds of thousands of years in almost every civilization? The Incas, the Mayas, those gentle Swedes, everybody south of them was called the Slavs. Right? Is there a civilization that you can come up with that did not practice slavery? And of course, that's how you got around. That's how you moved. Now, is it a complete coincidence that most slavery went away in legal, term, legal terms in developed countries in decades after hundreds of thousands of years? Or might it have something to do with the fact that five, a barrel of oil is the equivalent of five to 10 years of human labor. And when you tie that to thousands of horsepower, then those two jet engines that brought you here are the equivalent of 320,000 people rowing you here. You have different choices. You make different choices. And when you make different choices and you have technology, life expectancy explodes across the world after centuries of being flat Wealth explodes across the world, and we don't have to enslave other human beings. Is it a complete coincidence that the first places to become abolitionists were the places that had the Industrial Revolution, like England, like the northern United States? Is it a complete coincidence that the places that today practice slavery are the places that are the least industrialized? That's not arguing there weren't incredibly brave abolitionists who put their lives on the line. That's not arguing that there weren't a lot of people who saw the wrong early, but the majority, whether they saw the wrong or not, practiced something which is absolutely a despicable thing for hundreds of thousands of years. When you think of ethics as ethereal, pristine, never changing, and you take the position, I'm wrong, and if you disagree with me, I will destroy your career, you're not taking into account that the rules can sometimes change across time. That technology is exponential. That these new technologies enable behaviors we couldn't before. So if technology changes ethics, and technology is exponential, and ethics changes at exponential rates, then one of the things you might be thinking about is the consequences of some of the technologies developed in this room. Because when you do this organ engineering and when you do synthetic cells and stuff, you can also do synthetic meats, cruelty-free beef, 380,000 bucks, 2013, not a lot of people eating synthetic hamburgers, 30 bucks, 2015, nine bucks, 2020. And as your cost curve comes down, even if you are a meat eater, it is not going to be acceptable to have killed a creature that was alive. And those pictures of you're going to the steakhouse on date night are not going to look as cute. That is not going to be a good picture in 30 or 50 years. Same thing with the environment. We've been modifying the environment, putting up tons and tons of CO2. But what happens when you have cost curves that look like this, that make solar and wind faster, better, cheaper than oil and gas and coal? When people have alternatives to this, how are they going to look in retrospect at what we did, having very different alternatives? And so what's okay today may be wrong tomorrow, and if you take the position, I know right and wrong, you allow no discussion, no tolerance, no evolution, no learning. I'm going to cancel you because you wore a costume. I'm gonna cancel you because you have an opinion that's different from mine. I'm gonna accuse you because you had a stupid tweet. And that's enough to ruin a career. 
And that makes these debates about what's right and wrong very difficult because they become very scary debates because we're not using two words. We're not using humility and forgiveness. These are words that are just banned from most campuses and most political debates. And so as you're thinking about this stuff, why should all of you care? Because a lot of you are driving this stuff. Because when you make synthetic organs, you can redesign synthetic organs and redesign their function and their longevity. When you program synthetic cells in a company that I co-founded, then you begin to make synthetic life forms. And those cellular platforms become and allow you to make synthetic living machines. And then another company we created allows you to have little desktop printers, just like laser printers, except that you can program cells, put in the sequence, and have the output in a living machine. As we go forward in this stuff, this is becoming scalable. And that has a whole series of consequences. You can begin to make biohybrid animals with rat heart cells, with rubber, with gold. You can begin to play with questions like, what is life? As Jack Shostak and Dimitar Saslov are doing. Thinking of taking the inorganic and making it something organic and creating life. Perhaps for the second time or perhaps for the millionth time or the billionth time. We'll find that out pretty soon again, thanks to the work of a lot of folks here. But these are absolutely fundamental questions, and we better discuss our notions of right and wrong with a little bit more humility, a little bit more forgiveness, and a little bit more caution that we are absolutely right and will always be so. Thank you very much. Juan, just one question. The notions of right and wrong, what's acceptable in society, over time kind of gets codified into rules and regulations and customs and so. Now it looks like many technologies and many scientific, scientific advantage, advances have kind of reached escape velocity when confronted to this. So our capacity to codify them seems to have fallen apart. Uh, how do we deal with that? So Part of the problem is it's accelerating, and, and these things that your grandparents would have thought X, Y, or Z about sex are now being compressed into a five-year cycle where you can go from, I'm not in favor of gay marriage, to I'm in favor of gay marriage, which in the current Pope's case was three years. From the letter to the Carmelites of this is a sin against God, to who am I to judge? Three years, right? And, and when these things get compressed to this stage, the pressure on all of you who are inventing, the pressure on all of you who are discovering, the pressure on all of you who are changing the rules as you make stuff that's new makes you much more powerful than legislators in setting the initial rules. And that's why these debates about right and wrong can't be HR manuals. Oh, I've, I read the HR manual. I know what's right, I know what's wrong, and I know what to do. That's not where the rubber meets the road. It's in the inventions that change society, and then eventually the legislators are gonna realize, oh my God, evolution might have happened, because we're still debating whether evolution happened in the United States, right? So they're a little far behind in this stuff. And all of you have to think more carefully about, huh, if I do this, what could I change? So the responsibility falls increasingly on the inventors. Yep. Juan, thank you very much. <laughs>